I had to get honest. I had to be open-minded and I had to be willing. Um, and the way that came for me was from surrender. It also came from me seeking out people uh, that had the recovery that I wanted. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12-step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Hey, everybody. So that was Buddy C that you heard at the beginning of this episode today. And Buddy is joining us from the great state of Georgia, I think about an hour outside of Atlanta, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Buddy's going to talk to us about a wide range of topics today. Uh, one of the first things we're going to talk about is his involvement in a uh, religion, I guess, uh, uh, a way of life, a philosophy, if you will, called Taoism. And if you're not familiar with Taoism, well, hold on and Buddy will uh, walk you through it. Uh, he's also going to uh, talk about his uh, first six years in AA, well, I should say in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, and his journey there and the struggle that he had getting sober and staying sober, which uh, I think many of us can relate to, and uh, his thoughts about suicide during that time. And then finally, he's going to talk about his involvement in a, an organization that uh, he is involved in called Transitions Daily. And so here is Buddy. Enjoy. Okay, everybody. So we are sitting here. Well, I say we're sitting here. I say I'm sitting here and I'm uh, uh, looking I'm, at. I'm sitting too, but we're just in different locations. Right. Uh, we're probably about, what, a thousand miles away, something like that, right in that area. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, whoever has a Maps Go out, Maps Go. Boy, am I dating myself. And whoever has a, a Google Maps out and could uh, get the distance between Dallas, Texas, Dallas, Texas and Georgia, they can figure it out. So anyway, we're sitting here with Mr. Uh, Buddy C. And uh, um, I, I, Buddy and I have uh, uh, got to know each other here over the last couple of weeks. I asked Buddy to come on Sober Speak, and I'm just uh, uh, excited as can be that he is here. So, Buddy, you know, I, I've told people before that I kind of like to ask one question and then right on the front end of this thing, and this just kind of takes me where my curiosity takes me after that. And what I know that you are familiar with and what I am curious about, so this is why it's going to be my first question, is you have recently started to dabble in, maybe that's not the proper term, but you are familiar with Taoism. Is that correct? Uh, yes, John, I started uh, studying Taoist thought, uh, and it, it's pronounced with a D, but it's actually spelled with a T. So it's T-A-O-I-S-T, Taoist? It is. Now, that's like asking someone if they're a Christian, okay? They could be anything from <laughs> from Catholic to Pentecostal, whatever, you know. So, I mean, it's the same way with this. They, they have a lot of different beliefs. I really... Um, started looking into Taoist philosophy, primarily starting with uh, listening to a lot of Alan Watts. Uh, he was a philosopher that he died back uh, 71, 72, but he brought a lot of Zen and that thought to the Western world. Uh, then I um, um, started reading different books. Thomas Merton did some research uh, in his day, um, but uh, I, I settled on the Tao Te Ching which is uh, 
uh, T-A-O-T-E-C-H-I-N-G. Uh, for those that don't appreciate the Southern accent, I'm going to spell those things out for them. I know it's kind of odd someone talking about Taoism with such an accent. Yeah. Now, I've got to tell you, your, your name is Buddy. You have this thick accent from Georgia, and we're sitting here talking about Taoism. There, it does take you a while to wrap your brain around it. Yeah. I, and I've tried to get rid of this accent over the years, and I just quit years ago and said, yeah. screw it. It's just what it is. So. Hey, yeah. <laughs> but um, what, what I found in Taoist thought, and it's more Taoist philosophy than it is Taoist religion. They get into a lot of things that I, I can't buy into, like uh, reincarnation and a lot of other things. But the, the idea of what's taught in the Tao Te Ching is really good in that it's all about our, in recovery, a lot of step one, a lot of letting go. Everything is, and it's even has a providence to it where everything's based on nature and nature is by rhythm and nature is by plan and design. And so is our lives by plan and design. And uh, this book was written, the Tao Te Ching, 2,500 years ago, and they were talking about the masters, the ancient masters at that time. So this is thought that's been around maybe who knows how long, 3,000, 4,000 years ago. So uh, it's very, very applicable to and very relatable things like can you, um, can you wait for your mud to settle, thinking about water, can you wait for your mud to settle for the right answer to appear by itself? Mm. you know that's letting go uh other things about letting go would be um you you can't hold on to so, something new until you let go of what you have you know if, you, if you're holding on to something you can't you can't grab something new you've got to let go first mm -hmm. you know all these things that we learn in recovery uh about being powerless uh about just letting things happen and just going with the flow and uh, all the water analogies, like the ocean's the largest body of water because it's the lowest and it continually gives back to the whole earth. Hmm. See, I mean, all those things, the, I mean, the bells and whistles start going off. And when I started seeing this, it just started speaking to me. I've, I've been sober almost 10 years. It'd be actually be 10 years uh, in just three weeks or so. So, uh, and I was six years in and out before that. So um, that the idea and my problem, what kept me from coming in and really um, uh, grasping AA in hindsight, what I could see was I could not understand how to let go, how to be powerless. I came from a um, a Christian background here in Georgia, just yeah, like so most that people. Was, that was going to be one of my questions there is that I'm, I was assuming you did not grow up a Taoist there in uh, Georgia. <laughs> no, I did not. Uh, I, I grew up in, uh, uh, in a Baptist church and then I went to actually a, uh, a, um, uh, a spirit filled charismatic church as a teenager. I didn't actually start drinking, um, alcoholically until uh, my late 20s early 30s wow. so uh yeah so it's, that kept me out of a lot of trouble i was afraid of hell so uh <laughs> <laughs> so it worked for, me for, bunch, uh, for several years you know i was scared <laughs> but uh uh but that kept me out of trouble as a teenager but uh the um the idea when i got into aa i always thought that God helped me with things. So when I had a problem, uh, uh, what I had learned in the past was I pray, I do what I can do, do my best, and God can do the rest. God will do the rest. As long as I'm doing all I can do, then God will come in and help me with the part I can't do. That's the way, that was the way my thought had always been, whether it's what I was taught or not. That's what I had, that's what I had learned. So um, when I got into when I, when I had problems with alcohol, I did the same thing and I prayed earnestly and I prayed as, um, sincerely as I knew how to pray. There was no conning going on. I needed help and there was no help coming and I could not figure out what was wrong, why God was not helping me with this. I'd been successful in business. 
I had, you know, I had the two kids. I had all the stuff, all the things, vacation house. I had all the stuff, but I could not stop drinking. Mm. And, and God just was not there for me in that. So it took six years of in and out. Now, at my first meeting, I saw someone who had what I wanted, and I was a lot smarter than this guy. So if he could get it, I knew I could. <laughs> because I approached this the same way I approached everything else. You know, you study it, you look at the problem, you figure out what the problem is, and then you solve the problem. Okay, mm -hmm. so I, I took the same approach with this as I did with everything. I was the guy when I was a kid, when I was going to play pinball, I sat there and read the instructions first because I wanted to know how to win. <laughs> <laughs> so I took the book and read it. I did what they said do because I'm going to read the instructions because I, I know that's how you win is by reading the instructions. <laughs> so I read the instructions, but I could not. Um, they didn't make uh, I, two and two was not equaling four. And the problem was. I was trying to apply the same wisdom and knowledge to solve my alcohol problem that I had applied to the rest of my life, and it didn't work. And what finally happened was I actually got to the point of suicide. Uh, after six years of in and out and not being able to stop drinking, I'd go a week or a month. I think one time I even went nine months. Uh, out of that six years, but I was back and forth. Back, I kept going to meetings because I knew that's where the answer was for me. So I had a sponsor. I had worked the steps much as I knew how to work them. Um, but I just could not, when the time came where I had to choose to drink or not, I chose to drink. And so looking back on that now, so six years in and out, right? And I had a similar experience. I was more like three years in and out. But can you, are you able to pinpoint what was, what made you turn the corner eventually? Why? Yes, very much so. I remember when it happened, I finally said, listen, God, either you are or you're not, either you deal with this or I'm out of here. I cannot keep doing this over and over and over again. And by out of here, you meant, I meant you were check out. So, I was going to check out. I said, I am not going to keep doing this. I cannot. And I think that was my real point of surrender. Because I think what I had to do was get out of the way so God can do it. I had a part in it. But it wasn't God helping me do anything. It was me getting out of the way so God could do it mm. for me. And I, and I think about it like a proverbial fence. Let's say you have the proverbial fence to get over, whatever your problem is, and it's this fence. Used to, I would approach the fence and I'd say, okay, where can I grab? What can I do? How can I? Okay, well, I'll do all I can. Then ask God to help me with what I couldn't do. And he had pushed the little cheek over that needed the little push to finish, right? But I did all most of the work myself, okay? Mm -hmm. That's how I saw this. Now, the way I look at it and the way it seemed to work for me was I look at the fence. I get to the proverbial fence. And I say, okay, well, I don't even try to get over. I, I look around. I say, okay, who needs help getting over this fence? There's got to be somebody around. I go help somebody else get over. There's always someone around. I help them get over and I get over the fence somehow. Maybe it's God puts me over. Maybe they pull me up. I don't know. All of a sudden, maybe I go under it. I don't know. All of a sudden, I'm around this fence without an effort on my part. I had effort, but that effort was in helping someone else, not myself. So, and, and Taoist thought rolls into that in so many different areas about getting out of the way and letting go and just going with the flow and um, not feeding the self, but making your life about other people and about, uh, uh, about the service that it takes that we learn in AA. Right. Stopping the self effort. Yeah. So, 
So, you know, you mentioned there about being, uh, uh, having some success in business. And uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about, yeah, I guess, practicing these principles in all your affairs. So I guess what I'd like to do is, is compare your success in business before you got into AA and what business meant to you in, before you got into AA and maybe what it means to you now and how that thought process may have changed. Thank you. Uh, I'd love talking about this because when I got into AA, I finally got this relief from my alcohol obsession. And then I looked at the steps and said, you know, this is I can practice this in all my affairs. So if I got this relief with alcohol, why can't I have this relief with everything? My relationships, my family, my business. So what I started finding out was I was in the real estate business at the time. Uh, I started buying rental houses in my in the early nineties. was um, was was how I got started. Um, and I would have a house that couldn't sell. And what I learned was what I would do is pray for uh, if there's an agent I didn't like. There's an agent. There's always somebody you don't like. You know that you, <laughs> they're just they just are. And uh, there's a lady in town I just don't like personality conflict, whatever, you know, I don't have no resentment against her. I just don't like her, you know? So I pray for her listings to sell. If my, if my houses weren't selling, I wouldn't pray for mine to sell. I would pray for hers to sell. <laughs> so that's the kind of way that I learned to practice some of this, uh, in business. And what I learned was, you know, alcohol was not my problem. It was a symptom of my problem. We got ahead to get down to causes and conditions. We learned that, that, that our problem is us. Our problem is not something external. Our problem is internal. So when we, when we start shining that light within and we start cleaning up, you know, uh, cleaning up our lives and trust God, clean house, help others and do the things we're supposed to do, uh, then those things start falling in place. So when in business, if, I had some issue. I knew the real issue was not what I was seeing. I needed to turn the light around and look within me and find out what in me needed to change. So that was a big part of me learning to practice this in all my affairs. And then um, another big part was I used to think it was up to me to make things happen, to make it work. You know, if I if I needed to make a sale, I needed to get out and uh, shake the bushes and make it happen, right? It was up to me. I was the, what, the master of my destiny. You know, all that, you know, all that self-help that we learn that's really pushed on us on the business side. Well, I started seeing that it's not self-help, it's self-sacrifice. That's the real solution, okay? So with me, I said, okay, this is not about helping me. How can I in business do what I had to do with alcohol. Okay. I knew with alcohol, I had to help someone else. And we learned that in AA that we're helped when we help someone else. When we, uh, it's like the Beatitudes say that if uh, we're full of care, we find ourselves cared for in the same way. So I said, okay, in business, how can I apply this? So I, I bought a lot of houses at the courthouse, a lot of foreclosures. Um, I had a couple of, one guy especially that would bid against me all the time. So I started praying for him, for his needs to be met, that he would get the houses he needed to buy and that, that God would bless him and do for him more than he could ever imagine. I mean, I, I laid it on really thick because I didn't want to have a resentment against this guy. And I knew that God was going to meet my needs, whether it was through a house there or whether it was someone else or, or whatever the case, there, there would be a way made for me that I didn't need to focus so much on the money, but just focus on doing the next right thing that was in front of me to do. So, and in, in all my interactions in business, um, make that interaction. What can I do for you instead of what you can do for me? Now I learned and what I found myself doing. It's like, you know, we read the promises that we realize God's doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. I found myself asking people, okay, is there anything else you need for me? And I used to would never ask that question because I didn't care what they needed from me. 
<laughs> I wanted something from them. And when I was done with them, I wanted to get rid of them as quick as I could so I could move on to someone else and get something from them, you know. <laughs> but, I, you know, of course, I didn't say that or I didn't want them to know that. But that was that was my agenda. So my agenda changed. So in every interaction, I had to change my motivation instead of that motivation being what can I get from you? And if I was nice to you, it was with a hook because I wanted something in return. Instead, I, I started leaving myself vulnerable and open-ended with those things. So that changing that intention was the big thing, John, with that. And, and for me, that was a lot of learning to practice that in all my affairs. And I am at a place in business at an ease that I've never been. Uh, as far as financially, uh, as far as the care of thinking this is up to me to make happen. Uh, I've never been at this place before, and um, it's really a good place to be. And, and it's all come from working the steps and working the program. And, you know, we know that um, the change that we're looking for, for me, this is just my experience, doesn't come from me going to meetings doesn't come from all these other things per se, but it comes from working the steps because, you know, the steps say, I, I remember I'd been the program, I don't know how many years, and I was sitting there thinking, you know, daydreaming during a meeting. And uh, I remember at the end of the meeting, they say the Lord's Prayer and they say it works if you work it. And I'm like, works if you work it? What does that mean? Works if you work it? I'm working it. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. I'm working, you know, I'm working hard. Why isn't this working for me? You know, and, and then I look and the very last step, you know, it says it verbatim that we had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. So I said, you know, I said, my problem must be that I'm not applying these steps to every area of my life. That must be my problem, even though I'd gone through the steps. And I, and I firmly believe I've gone through the steps. I go through the steps every day, and I know that eight, you know, uh, 10, 11, 12 are maintenance steps, and we, we shouldn't have to go back through the steps again after, you know, after we go through the first blah, 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 you know, all that. But for me, um, I'm very conscious of that first time I went through the steps. Uh, I uncovered very little in my fourth step. The next time more, the next time more. And every now and then um, I have to go through that. It's a good practice for me just to go through it fresh. And what it seems to be for me, it seems to be the goal is to better do step three all the time. Uh, because that's about turning my will and my life over to the care of God. I make a decision to do it. It's like the frog on the log, you know. You got three frogs on the log. One makes a decision to jump. How many are there? There's still three because he decided. Doesn't mean he jumped. So same thing, you know, and so you make this decision and the rest of the steps help me to turn my will and life over to God's care. So I think for me, every day, the goal of this whole program is to better turn my life over to God's care in every area. You know, and it's not only my will, but it's the whole care and concern of my life. Everything that I'm even concerned about, turning all, letting go of all of that, which is back to the Taoist thought, is letting go of all those things and just letting, you know, letting God have it, you know. And uh, if I'm not doing that in an area, I'm going to start seeing too. I'm going to start seeing insanity. I'm going to lose my peace. And then if I let that stay long enough, I'll start seeing it physically. I'll start seeing step one. I'll start seeing unmanageability. So that's kind of my warnings. And so like an exa a real life example of that would be uh, if I were in business and uh, I started had uh, a concern that I wasn't turning over to God, that I wasn't turning an area of my life over. Uh, let's say I had a had some deal going on that that I was worried about instead of letting it go. Then I would start stressing about it, which would be, would be too, I'll be losing my peace. And then I would start getting angry about it, or I'd get angry at my wife or angry at someone. Then I've got unmanageability. It's out there in the open, you know. So uh, 
uh, it's pretty simple when I think about it, you know, but it's all about me turning more of my life over to God's will, not just my drinking. If all I did was my drinking, I'd be a miserable person still. <laughs> yeah, I understand that. I, uh, I can relate to what you're saying there, brother, buddy, because I have uh, been there myself, my friend. Let me just do a real quick, uh, a mid-tro here it says uh, we'll be continuing our conversation with Mr. Buddy C in just a moment. Just a reminder, you are listening to Sober Speak. You can find us at soberspeak.com. There you'll find uh, eh, 45 or so other epi- episodes you can listen to for free. Uh, you'll also find the donate button there on our website. Uh, and if the spirit moves you to do such, please use it. If not, it's okay. Please keep in mind that this podcast is fu- funded by you, the listener. Sober Speak is a self-supporting organization through our own contributions. We are not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. We do not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorse nor oppose any causes. Okay, now back to Buddy C. So, Buddy, one thing I was thinking of while you were talking there, and that is, we've been talking a lot about present day and we've been talking about, you know, you coming into the program, but let me go. I'm always curious about people, how they grew up. So if your teachers were to describe you when you were a kid, if your parents were to describe you when you were a kid, how would they describe you? And and what do you think of yourself as a child? Um, In school, I was an overachiever. I uh, graduated second in my class in high school. And uh, went uh, went to a little bit of college, but not much actually. I just I got a job here. It was not um, um, everyone didn't go to college, so I looked for work. But uh, um, I was always dependable. I was always someone that you could count on. And um, got to remember, in high school, I was involved in church too. So um, I didn't have these. Traits did not come out at that time, when but I was always traits. You're talking about alcoholism. Uh, yes, my need for a spiritual solution and where it led me. Uh, I was always looking for a spiritual solution. Always. Um, I, I, that's what led me to church as a teenager. Uh, I remember when I was seven, eight years old, broke my arm and asked my mother for a pain pill when I didn't need it because I wanted to feel different. So I've always wanted to feel different. Always wanted. I, there was always something missing. Always. I was always looking for that. To, it's not that way now, but there, but it was. It Did was. you have brothers and sisters, big family, small family? Uh, two brothers, both younger. Uh, so, you know, not huge family, but, uh, you know, average probably for this area. You know, not... Uh, uh, my, my father worked an hourly job. Um, I, I was very motivated when I was younger, um, in my twenties to make a name for myself. So that's why I, I worked hard, uh, bought rental houses and, um, it was, it was interesting. I had enough rental houses bought to be able to retire with those paid off when I was 40. I'm 52 now. Um, and, and I thought to myself, you know, there is no way I will sell these houses or do these houses are off limits. Ended up having to sell them because I had a business fail because, uh, everything I did worked and this was, I I was getting involved in another business and it was going to work too, because I was involved. (laughs) (laughs) This is before my alcoholism was in full swing. And actually when I had to sell those houses, I had a lot of my value placed in in what I had attained. And when I had to sell those things, it was, um, it was very difficult on me. And at that time, alcohol really saved my life because, uh, it kept, it numbed me for a couple of years while, um, i worked my way through those things. Um, and then it, of course it turned on me. Um, then, um, then I ended up with pancreatitis. I was in the hospital. I had, um, Six weeks total over probably six months, had uh, two surgeries, lost 60 pounds. I was down to 133 pounds when I came out of the hospital. I was on a ventilator for a few days, told my wife to pick out my pallbearers. I had a 50-50 chance of living. Then I came out. 
So d- help me with the timeline on this. When you had the pancreatitis, and was that during your six years where you were in no, and out? Of it? it was before. Before my six years. So you went back for more, huh? Yes. Yeah, that was before my six years. I hadn't even been to AA yet. And I got a funny story with that. I was uh, uh, there was a doctor that was helping me, and and I would um, uh, I told him I was ready to stop drinking, and he sent me to a. Uh, a rehab facility and I was a landlord and I carried a pocket pistol like people carry a pocket knife. Cause if I was around, I was either picking up money or I was fixing to pick up money. That's the only reason I was there was to collect. And so I walked into this uh, rehab and they were asking me all the questions. If I'd ever considered suicide. And I said, yes, how would you kill yourself? I'd say probably with a gun. Then the next question was, do you have a gun on you? And I said with you. And I said, Yes. Well, I wasn't planning on using it. I mean, it was in my pocket because I carried it all the time. Had a had a license to carry, you know. And so they scooted out of the room. Like, oh shit, they're fixing to come. Two big guys are fixing to come in here and get me. So I, I scooted out a side door and left. And uh that was my first experience with the rehab. But uh, uh they called and said, You can come back. I said, No, nah, it's okay. I've already left and bought a half gallon. So <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's uh, all that was before AA. AA was the last place I wanted to try because I thought only, uh, you know, like we hear from ev- from almost everyone, you, we don't come to AA because we're on a winning streak. You know, <laughs> you know, I tried everything else first. And then when I came, I realized that it was just normal people in AA. It was not who I thought. AA would be comprised of. I mean, there were doctors and attorneys, judge, every, I mean, there were all these different ways and walks of life in AA. And I I could not believe that because, uh, what, what I thought an alcoholic was, was not me. I was, I was better than that in my thinking, you know? So, uh, I had to, uh, I had to do some, you know, have some humility and, and actually, I went to a meeting in a town, a neighboring town instead of here. I wouldn't come to a meeting in, in the town where I live. I drove 30 miles away and went to a meeting over there. But, uh, eventually ended up over here in a meeting, you know, but uh, it's, um, you know, that was uh, that was in 01. And then um, uh, actually, I started in, in um, AA in 02. And then 08 was when I was able to actually start putting some time together. So take me to 2008, maybe moving a little bit forward. Were you, the, the, you talked about your wife there. Were you, did you still have the same wife when you were coming in? I AA? did. I did. And um, that was an interesting story when I went to make my amends. Um, uh, I, I felt really bad of, about uh, my relationship with my first wife. We had two children. Uh, they're grown now. Uh, they're 20 and 22. And I, um, I I was working with my sponsor and I said, you know, I said, I've just treated this woman horribly. She stuck with me all that time. I get, I get sober and then I divorce her. Oh, wow. So how long were you sober before you divorced her? Oh, it was, um, right at a year. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I told, you know, I've really felt horrible about that. And, And I asked my sponsor, I said, how do I do this? And he said, well, what do you appreciate about her? Do you have some things you appreciate? He says, she already knows what you've done wrong. He says, what, what do you appreciate? And I said, well, that's a different way of looking at it. I've never, I said, well, and, that, and I came up with a good list. I said, she's a great woman and all these things. And he said, okay, well, go tell her what you appreciate and see where that goes. And I said, okay, I did. And it worked perfectly. Wow. Do you remember bits and pieces of that conversation? Oh, yeah. Uh, I met her at a Starbucks. Uh, now, we were, of course, we were divorced. Um, we we were talking because of the kids. We were talking occasionally, but we weren't talking every day or any kind of, no kind of relationship of any kind, you know, just when we had to communicate. Uh, I met her in a public place and uh, we met at a Starbucks. And how long was this after you had been in a, after you'd been sober? Uh, I'd been, uh, this was probably th- three years. Okay. So it was about a couple years between when you got divorced and when you had. This right. Divorce. Right. Yes. Yes. Well, at least two years in after the divorce. 
Um, and she was bitter about all of that and which I don't blame her. So, uh, so I just told her, you know, the things that I appreciated in her, you know, and, and it worked really well. Things like, you know, she was a great mom. Um, I appreciate, you know, her standing by me in business, you know, all the things, you know, I just had a whole list of things, just a normal average stuff, you know, but I looked and told her I really appreciated it and that she did a great job and, you know, and I left it at that. And, and it worked. It, it relieved that anger and resentment on her part. And it gave me relief on, on my side. And I never would have thought, because that's not the way that I had heard of working a fourth step. And it wasn't a cop out fourth step. It wasn't to keep from, you know, there, there was no, you know, things that I was hiding from her because she had already quizzed me about things that she, you know, and I'd already told her the truth about things that she wanted to know about, you know, so this was, this was about truly mending the relationship, not saying I'm sorry. Do you think she was a kind of an unexpected type of conversation for her? Yes. Yes, I do. And uh, I have heard from, you know, through friends since then that, um, that it really did benefit her and it did help her, which is what I wanted to happen. So, uh, and we have a good relationship now. We, we there's no animosity. There's no, none of those things. So, and we still communicate because of the children, uh, when there's things to communicate about. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a very interesting way of uh, making an amends. I've never really thought about that. Just sitting down with somebody and sometimes, you got to be creative, right? And not every amends is the exact same amends for every person. You got to take, you know, I I don't, I don't know if that's AA police approved, (laughs) (laughs) but sometimes, like you said, though, we've got to get creative. And uh, I think that's what the spiritual awakening is about because it's about getting away from the rule and, and doing what gives life, you know, and, and that gave life into the, uh, into the relationship, into the situation, which, which I think is the purpose anyway. Yeah, it, you know, uh, I'm not a, a biblical scholar by any means, but I do know that there are many stories within the Bible, and I'm sure there are the same things within Taoism and all the other religions to where we as humans think one way, and then God comes through with a completely different, sometimes out of left field type of solution that you know, you always hear God works in mysterious ways, his duties to perform. And in that particular case, it sounded like those were the right words at the right time. Right. You know, and those things happen when, in my thinking, when we let go of our having to figure everything out. You know, another Taoist saying is that if you want uh, knowledge, you learn. If you want knowledge, you learn something every day. If you want wisdom, you unlearn something every day. Very good. That it's not about what we know. It's about letting go. You know, it's about getting out of, getting out of the way. It's about, uh, you know, being a channel, not, you know, being soft and pliable instead of hard and inflexible. So lots of, lots of good things there about that. But, uh, uh, no, John, that's, uh, that's pretty much my story. I, I sponsor a lot of guys. I tell you what my biggest struggle is. Sometimes I think I need to be doing business and God will send me someone to work with and I'll have to go work with somebody. And I still say it that way sometimes. You know, I have to go. Okay. But I know that that at that moment, that's what I need to be doing. And, and everything falls into place. It all just works. And I don't quite understand that. My, my income is not equivalent to uh, the energy that I put out for that. You know, I mean, it's just not. And, and if I, um, I, I think it's all about me offering my moment up as an offering. Then I think God changes us from the inside out. Then, then I just respond when I see God doing something. And if I'm ever stuck and I don't know what to do, I just look around for somebody I can do something for. And if I can do that in more moments of the day, 
I think that's where the peace and joy is that we're looking for. I really do. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, when I think about it, or when I kind of flash back through my life, all the times that really meant something to me, uh, um, it never comes down to, oh, remember that time I got that bonus at work or that commission at work, you know. Work that extra Saturday. It, uh, <laughs> it never was that, you know, when, you, when you're on your deathbed, <laughs> I don't think it's ever going to be that uh, we're going to think, you know, I wish I would have worked more Saturdays. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just put in a little more time. Just a little more time. I, my, my checking account could have just one more zero. I always <laughs> wanted one more zero, you know. <laughs> so I know also I was talking to you a little bit before you started, before we started here today. And uh, uh, tell me a little bit about, I think you have a, a podcast that you are actually beginning, you're about to start. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, I work with. Uh, Omar Pinto, the the share uh, the share podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, he started a community. It's called the Share Recovery Community. SRC is what he's calling it now. And we do a meeting on Thursday mornings discussing the Tao Te Ching. We just take a chapter and we discuss it. Uh, we do a, a video of that and post it in the community for the members that they can access anytime. And it's meaning so much to the people who come to the meeting. I told, oh, I said, you know, we should make a podcast out of this. So we're in the process now of producing that into a podcast. As a matter of fact, I've got it out everywhere except I think iTunes and Spotify. Now I'm waiting on iTunes to give us uh, the approval. It's still saying that it's submitted for review. So uh, once it comes back uh, approved, we'll be we'll have it out on the air. It's going to be uh, the Dow of our understanding. The de- so that and that is T A O right the Tao of our so the God of our understanding the God of under our yes I get it yeah recovery <laughs> podcast uh, I had a sponsee uh, I guess it'd be grand sponsee that uh, that gave me that one so I can't take credit for that <laughs> that's great I asked him if I could use it and so uh, so we are but but it's just from our meeting and we have a few people that come to that meeting every week and it's such good content that we said, you know, we should share this with some more people. So, And I want to mention another thing. Uh, uh, another reason that I know Buddy is because he, um, how do I put that? I found a, I came across a website called Daily, a, how do you say it? DailyAAEmails.com. So it's DailyAAEmails.com for anybody out there. And I, by the way, as I have mentioned, I get there. This is, uh, I'm just trying to put a tool out there. I get, I get nothing for this, nor do I want anything for it. But for me, this is a good tool. Uh, and in the daily, if you go to DailyAAEmail.com, you can subscribe to the email. And won't you tell them, uh, buddy, sure. what's on that? It's email? interesting. It's interesting interesting how that if you don't mind john i'll I'll quickly share how that started um i had a fella in my home group that i just didn't like you know one of those old men that's real cogity about everything and grumpy and you're not one of those guys are john are you one of you're not one of those guys i hope not i don't think so (laughs) well this guy you know he was just by the rules everything ex-military i mean everything and you know he was one of those grumpy ones that people didn't like He was in the hospital, had heart problems and in a neighboring, the neighboring town that I had to go to for my first AA meeting. And I just felt like I needed to go visit him. And he's not someone I even liked. (laughs) And, and I said, well, okay, I'll go visit him. So you know know you need to do one of those situation things. Is listening to that intuitive thought for sure. That is fantastic. I know that. So I went and visited him come to find out he had been distributing transitions daily for 10 years he started it from scratch he had been sending this email out every day with all of the daily readers that you see in transitions who all the you know it's got the thought of the day and the acronym and as bill sees it daily reflections 24 hours just for today i mean all the daily readers and um I didn't even know he did this and he had been doing this by hand every day for 10 years, sending this, pushing the button. 
so I got to know him a little bit, and he asked me that when he goes to the great meeting in the sky for me to take this over for him. So uh, he's still here, but I'm doing more of the responsibilities. I set it up on an auto send now that goes out every night. I've I've worked on it to get a lot of the the, the formatting and all a little better and those things. And through that, um, I started talking to different podcasts and I got to know all the people in these podcasts that we've talked about from transitions. So if you were wanting to talk about how business was supposed to work, I think transitions is a good example too of me going and visiting someone I didn't even like in the hospital and it's involved, evolved into all the things like this very conversation would not be happening if it was not for that visit. So we never know where our small services, uh, acts of service are going to lead. We just have no idea. So we just have no idea. So I'm just grateful that I had a moment of clarity enough to be able to be used because if, if God didn't use me for that, he would have used someone else because I think that work was going to continue. And since then, we've become an online group of AA uh, with a with a service number. We do regular donations to uh, to international and all those things. Uh, we've we've got in compliance with AA. We're no longer a, a devotion. We're a daily distribution with a secret Facebook group for discussion. So. We, uh, we abide by the traditions. We, we do have podcasts like yours on the end of dailyaemails.com. We have a list, like an announcement list would be at a meeting. If you wanted to announce something for the good of the members of AA, that's the way we look at that. So we, we try our best, though, to abide by, you know, as much as we can by the traditions and, and keep things as, as simple and as traditional as we can. Yeah. So it explained to me, and it took me a while to kind of figure out the daily AA, daily AA emails.com and transitions daily are the same thing, right? Yes. Uh, what I did was I came up with the URL daily AA emails.com to share in meetings. So it was an easy thing for people to remember. And that points to transitions daily. So transitions daily is the real, um, um, meeting is the real group and daily AA emails just points to that so that it's easy to find. Yeah. And so, and once again, I just want people to know this is a good tool. And I noticed that once I join daily AA emails.com, you or somebody sends out an invite to join transitions daily, the Facebook group, right? That's me. And, and anyone that we have over 15,000 now that get transitions every day. And it's incredible. I, I'm just grateful to be involved. And uh, if, if someone's in a remote location, when they get transitions, they're actually having contact with another alcoholic. They're having contact with me <laughs> because I make sure that goes out every day. So uh, you can know that you've had contact with someone when you see that email come through. Yeah. And like I said, that email, it has all the various, you don't have to grab five different books. Uh, you can, you know, read the, the reflections, uh, that there's a lot of quotes in there from as Bill sees it and everything that buddy just went into before there. And you could just go through them all. And some of them I like more than others. And, you know, you just, uh, I would like to have a Dow quote in there, but uh, I'm going to wait until years to come when I'm really, <laughs> when we have, when, when, when we can do, cause I don't think Clint would approve of that. <laughs> I know what my limitations are at the moment. I understand. <laughs> uh, he, he wants to keep it very, very, uh, I remember I made a post, uh, a Richard Rohr post in the Facebook group and he deleted it. <laughs> Dude, that's not, we don't need that in there. <laughs> <laughs> and Richard Rohr is fairly. Uh, oh yeah, it was you know, good. It was you know, a really good. good. It was about it was about his breathing underwater quote. Mm -hmm. You know, every. I mean, it was really good. You know, but that's not AA. We don't need that in there. I swear <laughs> <to God. laughs> you got to know where to pick your fights, right? That's it. That's it. But uh, but you know, it's just God doing for me, John, and and it's more of God doing for me. The more I learn to let go and get out of the way. That really is, is what makes a difference for me. 
So was there anything before we wrap it up here that you want to kind of put on the end that, uh, you know, usually ask people, uh, we have all kinds of different folks that are listening to this, right? Many different countries. And, um, uh, but my main concern, generally speaking, is somebody who's fairly new in sobriety. Uh, they're trying to get traction. They're wondering if this thing really works or not. Uh, can you share some of your experience around that? Sure. Um, I had to get honest. I had to be open-minded and I had to be willing. Um, and the way that came for me was from surrender. It also came from me seeking out people uh, that had the recovery that I wanted. So if I found someone that had the recovery that I was looking for, I would, uh, I would ask them how they were doing it. Then I would do what they were doing. And if, there, if you did not have someone local, go, there's lots of recovery meetings online. There's lots of, uh, you can go AA online and look, and there's a lot of things there. There's a lot of recovery groups and Facebook. If There's a lot of recovery podcasts that will lead you to groups. Uh, there's so many different places you can go and so many different podcasts out there. that uh, And go, and when you see someone who has a recovery you're looking for, uh, private message them and ask them how they're staying sober and start from there and be open-minded enough to, because if, if what you're thinking uh, actually work, why would you even be asking, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if, if it was working, then why would we even be having the conversation? So you got to be willing to change your thinking. Uh, actually, another Dallas quote with that would be uh, stop thinking and solve all your problems. You know, uh, but it is all about letting go, getting out of the way. Uh, uh, we had a, a lady in meetings that used to say, uh, it's not really let go or let God. God's going to do regardless. It's let go or get dragged. And she was right. And I don't like getting dragged. So, and, and you know, the real goal, John, is not letting go. The real goal is to never hold on to begin with. Is to let those things come to you like, like a slow moving river. Let those things come to you, use them while they're in your presence, and then let them go on by. Not stop them and block them from coming to you, nor hold on to them as they leave. And being at a place of rest that you're confident that you don't have to hold on to things because your higher power has more on the way for you, whatever you need. That if, when you can be at that place of peace and that place of rest, uh, I, I think that's the whole point of the program right. is for me. Well put, Mr. Buddy. Well put. All right. So just as a reminder, uh, if you want to reach out to Buddy or me or anybody else, you can go to feed. You can email us at feedback at silverspeak.com or you can go to silverspeak.com. You can click on the uh, contact us tab and you will be presented with a little microphone uh, and on that microphone you can leave us a message which we can play on the air if it's uh, between PG and R rated uh, just to try to keep it uh, to a minimum uh, on the uh, uh, inappropriateness I guess we should say um, and uh, that's about it. So I am going to, once again, thank Mr. Buddy C. for being here. Thank you, Buddy, very much. Thank you, John. Enjoyed it, sir. And uh, then I'm going to wrap it up with this, uh, page 164 of our text. And I say text are the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It says, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us, such as Buddy and myself, hopefully, as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. Yes, sir.